No lasso. So one more comment about the rationale for this center. And I'll relate this to um, an article I read about a year ago in the New York Times. I'm not going to read it, but I just will tell you in, la- in, the, in the case you'd like to find it, because you can find it on the archives. And it is th- the title of the article by a, a columnist for the New York Times by the name of Michel, a- Michel Alexander. The name of the article is, What If We're All Coming Back? And uh, just the, the, the brief heading, or the kind of the subtext, or the subtitle, the prospect of being reborn as a poor person in a world ravaged by climate change could lead us to a very, could lead us to very different political decisions. And a whole article on that. She comments, I don't believe in reincarnation. She's not promoting it. She's just saying, if we did believe it, might we all, all not be incredibly more responsible for the planet? If we think it's not only my kids, and I don't like them all that much anyway, and the grandchildren don't know them much, you know, I'm speaking cynically, but the whole notion of, well, it's somebody else's problem, and then the very notion that it might be actually my problem. And so she makes a very interesting case, just if that were true, wouldn't we have a very different attitude in terms of the, Im- the impact we're having on the environment right now? It's what if we're all coming back, and it was October 29, 2018. It's worth a read secular, but she raises a very thought-provoking point. And what's really, I find, bizarre is when it comes to this simple question, like we know the origins of planet Earth, we know the origins of the galaxy, we know kind of like the Big Bang, the inflationary period, we know the origins of so many things throughout the universe. And yet, when it comes to that which is most intimate to us, our own minds, there really is, and it, this is not descriptive, or this is not how critical or pejorative, it's just a flat out, state, flat, flat out factual statement. There's no scientific theory at all. There are beliefs that are never examined, but no scientific theory, because a scientific theory is such because it can be tested, at least in principle. There's not even one. I think I know all of them. If you know an exception, let me know. Until you do, I'm going to keep on saying there is no scientific theory about the origins of the human mind and all they have is speculations, and, and then beliefs coming out of fundamental assumptions that everything boils down to matter. Just like the belief in the luminiferous ether, for which there was no evidence, but, they believe, but the belief of mechanistic materialism insisted it must exist. As Lord Kelvin said, this is what we're most convinced of two years after the evidence came in that it wasn't there. Two years after the Michelson-Morley experiment. He's still saying we're totally confident of this. And for years afterwards, they're still saying, J.J. Thompson, all configurations of matter and energy are actually coming from the ether. This is like 20 years after. The evidence was in, and it's just holding to these immutable views, a fixed idea, that for something for which there's no evidence and there is profound contrary evidence, still believing it, until finally, as Max Planck said, the founder of, of quantum mechanics, Science evolves death by death. No, funeral by funeral. (laughs) The old people just have to die off because they have their whole reputation staked in mechanistic materialism, mechanistic materialism, religious fundamentalism, and they will, you know, they're just going to hold on to that until they die. It doesn't matter what evidence you give them because it's too humiliating to give it up. The evidence for scientific materialist views of the the origins of the mind are nothing. The contrary evidence is overwhelming. When contemplatives in Taoism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, not all of them, but contemplative and all of these have come to this conclusion. That's a lot. That's, That's some evidence. And then Pythagoras and Plato and Socrates, all promoting that. And now 40 years of very rigorous research at the University of Virginia and elsewhere, massive amount of evidence, and still it's not making an impact. It really has made almost none, because the materialists, they they have the microphone, and they just make sure none of those people get to the microphone, to the media, to funding, public funding, and so forth. So they've they've kept their their stranglehold on the evidence that's contrary to their beliefs very successfully. And I'm sitting down with the tyranny not by shouting louder, but by bringing in open-minded scientists and really professionally trained contemplatives and having a controlled experiment. That's never been done before. You're just finding kids that 
kids that do or do not remember, remember past life. But there's no controlled experiment. And the first thing the scientists will say, it's not a controlled experiment. That's anthropology. And the physicists are going to throw out anthropology, like yesterday's dry bread. You know, it doesn't count. But in a controlled experiment, and I've already laid out how it can be done with positive and negative results, clean as a whistle, with the most rigorous scientific scrutiny, and bring in the scientists and bring in the press so that Buddhists are ready to embarrass ourselves. That we're really willing to say, hey, we're going to put this on the line, and if we have people achieving shamatha, and then you ask, okay, recall what happened two years before they did, before you were born, and they're all coming up with no signal, no signal, okay, publish it. Publish it, you know. But if this were done in a very careful, critical way, and it can be shown as simply a fact, finally, this has been solved, it was solved a long time ago, but now in complete companionship with scientists, that your mind came from a previous life, figure out what's going to happen after this life, then people might start taking that seriously. We might all start taking the, the environment very seriously. If it's for us, and not just our kids or grandchildren, that could have a big impact. It would be the biggest revolution. Bigger than Darwin, big, bigger than Galileo. If it's simply a fact, and not something that some religious people believe. So let's find out. I mean, that, that just no reason that should be a mystery. It's not that difficult to find. All you need is shamatha and some really good scientific methodology. So we're after big, we're after big fish here. Not just having a nice time in bliss, luminosity, and non-conceptuality. If you want that, take drugs. <laughs> Don't, but, you know, do. <laughs> All right, you ready for Yang Tanah Mache? Um, so, this is from, I will give you his root text, and because I received his oral commentary, and I was translating for his oral commentary, when I find it would be really helpful, then I'll comment, elucidate a little bit on his pointing out instructions where he's just left off from shamatha, goes right into Vipassana, and right in from there to pointing out instructions. It was breathtaking. And this is a man who was alive and just, just until a few, a few years ago and was speaking totally from his own experience. So please find a comfortable position. We'll jump right in. Settle your body, speech, and mind in the natural state.
So we pick up in his root text where we left off. The last sentence being, this natural settling of thoughts is a way of resting, but it is not the main practice. But in that very way of resting, you are ready to encounter pristine awareness, which is the main practice. As soon as you rest in your natural state, thoughts spontaneously cease and depart. In the natural lucidity where thoughts disappear is the empty, transparent, essential nature of the mind. Here's where he brought in commentary. Optimally, once you've achieved shamatha, you're resting in the substrate consciousness, thoughts have all died down, disappeared into the substrate. And all that's left is your awareness in space. Then you cross the threshold over into Vipassana, and you probe into the very nature of that which is experiencing the bliss, luminosity, and non-conceptuality the space of the substrate. You probe right into the nature of the subjective mind, this subtle mind, into that which is experiencing. And you ask, what characteristics do you have? Do you exist? Experiencing mind, subjective mind, do you have a color? a shape, a location. Or are you empty of all substantial characteristics? But here you are, the subjective mind that is experiencing, that is knowing, But you weren't always here. Where did you come from? What are your origins? And you look for the origins of the subjective mind and you see not only that you can't find them, you find that they are unfindable. You don't come from anywhere, really. And right now, where are you really located? Where are you? And you see that this objective mind that knows, that perceives, is not located anywhere, empty of location. And this mind won't be around forever. It disappears every night. It will disappear at death. Where will you go? What is your destination when you're gone? And when you probe deeply, you see it's not going anywhere. It has no destination. Empty of origin, empty of location, empty of destination. A subjective mind, do you exist? Are you here? Wherever that may be. If you exist, you must be knowable. If you're knowable, you must have characteristics. Subjective mind, what are your characteristics? By what qualities can I know you? And you look deeply, you probe deeply. And 
And although consciousness has characteristics, thoughts have characteristics, emotions, that which experiences them, that which illuminates all appearances, where are its characteristics? None are to be found. So could it be that this objective mind doesn't exist at all? An illusion, a fabrication, a lie. But if it's utterly non-existent, then it couldn't draw any conclusion. It couldn't know, it couldn't perceive, it couldn't do. It can't be non-existent. And it can't be existent because it has no characteristics that can be found. Nowhere seen, it can't be existent. And it can't be non-existent. And the walls of this conceptual category crumble, shattered, broken through. to an awareness that is primordial, that precedes and transcends all conceptual constructs, exist, non-exist, arising, passing, and so on, unborn, unceasing, non-local, transcending time, empty of inherent nature. We continue with this root text, an experience arises that is like space without anything on which to focus and free of falling to any extreme. This empty, essential nature is the Dharmakaya. Right there in that emptiness is the clear and lucid manifest nature of the mind. Devoid of any expressible, substantial characteristics, its own spacious and unimpeded luminosity, which is naturally clear, is the Sambhogakaya. There is no other perceiver of this luminous, empty, pristine awareness. of this luminous, empty, pristine awareness, that which is perceived is the empty dharmakaya. And that which perceives is luminous, primordial consciousness. These two may be expressed as emptiness and luminosity, and they may be called absolute space or dhammadhatu and primordial consciousness.
very brief commentary. Once you have identified the emptiness of inherent nature of your own awareness, that which knows, identified it emptiness of all the conceptual categories of the mind, including existence and non-existence, That very awareness that is empty is the Dhammakaya, unborn, unceasing, timeless. In that emptiness, do you not experience a brightness, a luminosity, a wakefulness, a clarity? And that is the luminous, manifest nature of the mind. Emptiness is the essential nature. The luminosity is the manifest nature. The luminosity ascertains the emptiness. And yet that emptiness is not other than the luminosity. There is no division between the knower and the known. They are primordially non-dual. The primordial non-duality of the Dhammakaya and the Rupakaya, Dhammakaya and Sambhogakaya. And this is the nature of your mind, the actual nature, always has been. But concealed under the veils of dualistic grasping and reification. And now when you cast off those veils, and look in upon the knower, you may for the first time recognize who you have always been. And when you so recognize, utterly rest, free of all activity, rest in that open presence. And we continue in silence.
So there's a bit more of his passage there, which you'll have in your notes that will send, be sent to you at the end of this retreat. But I thought maybe that was enough for now. Um, and you'll note in that incomplete passage, because it went on for a fair amount longer, there was no reference to Nirmanakaya, Dhammakaya, empty essential nature, Sambhogakaya, luminous manifest nature, the two non-dual, emptiness and luminosity. So very familiar mm, coupling. But as for Nirmanakaya, he does explain later that when the Vidyatara is simply dwelling in this meditative equipoise, or if his objective awareness is pristine awareness and that which you're realizing is emptiness, that at that time, of course, it's a completely non-conceptual state, and moreover, you're entirely withdrawn from the entire phenomenal world, like the Arya Bodhisattva in meditative equipoise and emptiness for the time being, you're immersed in nirvana. And in this case, nirvana perceived from the perspective of pristine awareness. So what about nirmanakaya? In nirmanakaya, he comments, is when you come out of meditative equipoise and you're once and again, once again engaging with the world around you, with its myriad sentient beings, he said when you come out of meditation in this post-meditative state, then spontaneous, all-pervasive compassion arises spontaneously. And that spontaneous, all-pervasive compassion is Nirmanakaya. It's kind of obvious why that would be the case, just even if you haven't had any experience. And that is you come out of meditative equipoise where you are truly awake. I mean, you're really awake. You're dwelling in Dharmakaya. You're awake. And then you, you're drawing that experience. You're letting that experience flow as much as possible into your post-meditative state. So you're not cutting it off, you're not severing yourself, but rather in your post-meditative state, doing your best to continue in that flow of viewing all phenomena of samsara and nirvana from the perspective of pristine awareness. You're in the center of your mandala of samsara and nirvana, and all that you experience, you are seeing as empty of inherent nature, equally pure, and equally pure creative expressions of your own pristine awareness. So it's quite magnificent. At the same time, you are aware that everyone around you, unless they're like you, everyone around you is a sleepwalker. They're all dreaming. And you look attentively with your heart open, probably have some very deep clairvoyance at this point, and you see what misery people are experiencing, animals and human beings and other realms of existence, you see the misery, just flavors and flavors of dukkha, all in the, each, for each sentient being in this self-induced dream that they call reality. They're all experiencing a non-lucid dream and suffering fundamentally because they don't understand what's going on, they're getting it wrong, and out of ignorance and delusion come craving, hostility, and all the rest. And you see, all they need to do is wake up. So you see the suffering, which arouse, kind of in a resonance arouse that profound empathy. But at the same time, because you, have, you know Dharmakaya, you know the actual nature of your own mind is primordially free, then you know as you have discovered this, you are now a Vijayadara, you know every sentient being around you has that capacity. So, so there's only one thing to do, and that is to do your utmost to awakening everyone around you. And so it is said, again crucially, that in this Dzogchen worldview then, that relative bodhicitta, that we regard as bodhicitta, this exchanging self and others and out of great compassion, aspiring for perfect enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings, which on the Sutrayana we cultivate, 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 and move from contrived to uncontrived, spontaneous, continue cultivating it as we proceed along the paths and grounds 
of the bodhisattvas and cultivate and cultivate. That if you identify Rikpa and are viewing reality from the perspective of Dharmakaya, which is ultimate bodhicitta, Rikpa is ultimate bodhicitta in the Dzogchen context, then out of ultimate bodhicitta, relative bodhicitta arises spontaneously and effortless. It completely makes sense, actually. So you don't need to do anything else. Once you've identified Rikpa, you don't need to do some other conceptual meditations and imagining sentient beings as your mother or exchanging self and other and all of that. All of that is wonderful. You don't need to do that because bodhicitta is arising spontaneously, effortlessly. And its equal display of compassion for all beings is nirmanakaya. And of course, it's the nirmanakaya by which one emanates, emanates forms to awaken all those around you. So we say on the sutrayana, even after one becomes an Arya Bodhisattva, and you're proceeding then along the ten Arya Bodhisattva Bhumis to perfect awakening, which would take roughly about two countless eons if you're following the sutrayana path. <laughs> One countless eon to become an Arya Bodhisattva, and then two to finish, uh, two more to finish, because it gets subtler and subtler as you go, more and more difficult. But even after you become an Arya Bodhisattva, you are still practicing with the mind of a sentient being. You haven't realized Rikpa. All your bodhisattvas have not realized Rikpa. Not on the Suryana. And so when you're meditating on emptiness, you're realizing it with the, the subtle mind of a sentient being. When you come into the post-meditative state, you're viewing all things as dreamlike because from the perspective of a sentient being, they're not dreams, they're dreamlike. Dreams are what you have at night and they're different from what you're experiencing in the waking state. So even after you become an Arya Bodhisattva, you, too, you still need the two wings of enlightenment. Ultimate bodhicitta, relative bodhicitta. Wisdom and skillful means. You need the two wings. If you have only realization of emptiness and you're not cultivating and deepening bodhicitta, a bird with one wing flies around in circles. And if you were not to have the realization of emptiness, but only a very great compassion, then you can fly around in circles. You'll never make it to enlightenment without realization of emptiness. So then you need to go back and forth, back and forth, going into meditative equipoise and then come out manifesting the deeds of a bodhisattva and then back into emptiness. And so they say it's like washing a deeply stained cloth on a, on a, 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 a what's that called, board, something board. Washboard, a washboard. <laughs> and you have to get the finest, the, the subtlest stains out. And that's a lot of scrubbing back and forth, namely 10 boomies worth. <laughs> Until you look at it, it's clean, and you're awake. But lots of scrubbing, in and out, in and out, and into emptiness, out into samsara, into emptiness, scrub, scrub, scrub it up, dub, 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 until all your obscurations are gone. <coughs> lots of work. It's good work, but it's very time consuming. Whereas if you can rest in rikpa, then you're coming out and you're still in rikpa, and you don't need to do anything outside of that. All you need to do is rest in Rikpa. And resting in Rikpa, that's the time when you have earned your way there. With your shamatha, your vipassana, you've identified Rikpa, you're able to dwell in Rikpa by the power of your shamatha and vipassana, you're able to dwell in it, then that's all you do. That is, you don't go out actively as a sentient being, try to cultivate this and, uh, and purify that, because everything will be given unto you from pristine awareness itself. It will arise spontaneously and effortlessly. So you're completely deactivate any sense of your being a sentient being in body, speech, and mind. You simply dwell in Dharmakaya and see all the qualities of Buddhahood emerge from that. So this is the context in which Padmasambhava gave those daytime dream yoga teachings. We'll get to the nighttime dream yoga teachings this afternoon, but I thought just a little bit more of background because Dzogchen meditation is nothing more than First of all, identifying the view, and that is identifying pristine awareness and viewing reality from that perspective and then sustaining that. That's all there is to Dzogchen meditation. There's nothing more than simply sustaining the view. And so a little bit more on the view might be helpful, and then we'll take our break in about 50 minutes for lunch. So I go back to the one book I keep with me if I were on a deserted desert island, and I can only have one. It would be the Vajra Essence. And this is revealed by Dujum Lingba, their teachings of Padmasambhava, manifesting in the form called the Lakeborn Vajra, Sokya Doji. And so just a few excerpts to give you a clearer sense of the view in which you can couch 
or embed your dream yoga practice within the context of Dzogchen. And so here, the Lake One Vajra, by way of his medium, by the way of his channel, Dujum Lingba, who is an incredible vidyadhara of it in his own right. Uh, but he says these are not his teachings. These he received in a pure vision. He wrote them down uh, when he was about 27, 28. And then finding even then, he was a young man and had this brilliant vision and all the teachings, 400 pages of it. Uh, that, what was it? I think it was 13 or was it 17 years? One of those two, I always mix up. But for years he felt he'd receive them, he could benefit, and he just sensed Tibet, late 19th century, and for some years he just felt, just like watching some bread rise in the oven, not quite, not quite, not quite. So I think it was 17 years before, 17 years of looking at his environment until he felt, okay, baked. And then he revealed the teaching. So he kept it as a dharma for himself for a while. And then I received those teachings from Gyatra Rinpoche after I had translated a number of texts under his guidance. I was living with him at this point, 1997, I think. And we translated Spacious Path to Freedom and Naked Awareness, Natural Liberation. My wife and I translated Bodhicharitara. And then I was, had nothing to do. So I said, Gyatra Rinpoche, would you like me to translate anything else? Because I'm living with him now, before I headed off to Stanford. And he said, yeah, how about Vajra Essence? I said, what's that? <laughs> it's this, let's listen. The Lake One Vajra said, this ground, now bear in mind, this ground is, is a kind of Buddhist trinity, indivisible, all three in one. Dharma Dhatu, Dharmakaya, energy of primordial consciousness. Primordial consciousness, energy of primordial consciousness, dhammadhatu, nirvana, absolute space. And so that's the ground. But then specifically, highlighting subjectively in terms of awareness, it is pristine awareness, primordial consciousness. And the Lake Born Vajra says, this ground is present in the mind streams of all sentient beings. But it's tightly constricted by dualistic grasping. And it is regarded as external, firm, and solid. So here the ground... The, the space here is simply dharma dhatu. But when that dualistic grasping arises, it looks out into the field of, of, dual, of the dharma dhatu, and then the dualistic grasping comes in, and then we grasp and solidify. We solidify our world, we solidify or individuate our own mind streams. We reify everything, we chunkify everything. So that's what he's saying. It's tightly constricted by dualistic grasping, and it, this dharmadhatu, is regarded as external, firm, and solid, make of chunky, made of chunky stuff. This is like water in its natural fluid state, freezing in a cold wind. So rikpa itself is said to be like fluid, but when dualistic grasping comes in, one's own mind stream is individ individuated, crystallized, frozen. And there's a world out there that's frozen solid, and then the dualistic grasping comes in and all the problems ensue. It is due to dualistic grasping onto subjects and objects that the ground, which is naturally free, becomes frozen into the appearances of things. And there's a quote there, I won't read it, you can read it, from Casey Cole, she's an outstanding science writer. She wrote a whole book called, I think it's Nothingness, and that's what I did my undergraduate thesis on, 500 pages of it. And I got to know her, she's a very good science writer. And, she get, and, draw, and then she interviewed world-class scientists about the nature of the vacuum, the nature of nothingness in modern quantum mechanics. And it turns out they use exactly the same metaphor. That the world started in, in per, perfect symmetry in the earliest stages, Big Bang, perfect symmetry. And then over time, from the fluid state of perfect symmetry, the world, in the course of cosmic evolution, froze into particles, fields, waves, atoms, galaxies. But it's all made of space. I thought, wow, how could they know that? And not know Dzogchen, because it's exactly the same thing and exactly the same breaking of symmetries, except in, conscious, in physics they don't know anything about consciousness. How they could get that far without knowing anything about consciousness at all, I must say, 
That's amazing they got that far. Because they didn't have Padmasambhava to guide them. You know, they're just working from scratch, from bottom up. Galileo, really smart people, but no visions. You know, so that's the view. And then the, the Lake Warren Vajra continues, as for meditation, throughout beginningless lifetimes in samsara, the original primordial ground, Samantabhadra, and Samantabhadra you can often see depicted in tankas as deep blue, indigo blue, uh, and it is simply the personification, the embodiment of your own pristine awareness. It's not some other god out there that we worship or that created the universe. Samantabhadra is divine and a personification, male form, personification of your own pristine awareness, not somebody else's, not Buddhist Shakyamuni's, your own, and then often depicted in union with Samatabhadri, the divine partner. Samatabhadri is white in color, and Samatabhadri is also not just some beautiful divine woman, but is a personification of Dharmadhatu. And Dharmadhatu and Dharmakaya are primordially in union, and that fundamentally is the, the ubiquitous fundamental root reason for all of the symbolism of Yap Yum deities in union all over the place in Tibetan iconography. It all just boils down to that. It all is nothing actually more than that. The union of emptiness and luminosity, of skillful means and wisdom, Dhammadhatu, Dharmakaya. And so Samatabhadra is the luminous aspect. Samatabhadri is the empty aspect, personified. So as for meditation throughout beginningless lifetimes in samsara, the original primordial ground, Samatabhadra, has pervaded the mind streams of all sentient beings, just as sesame oil pervades sesame seeds. However, under the influence of dualistic grasping and clinging to true existence, the mind becomes dimmed, as if by darkness and deluded. But now, apart from identifying your own nature, there is nothing whatsoever on which to meditate and you thereby gain freedom for yourself. As a result of holding your own ground, freedom is experienced in the domain of pristine space, unstructured and unmodified by the intellect, and you are infinitely immersed in a great self-emergent primordial rest. And this is like space merging with space. Previously, your intellect demarcated outer from inner and grasped at them as being distinct. Now, ascertaining that there is no outer or inner, you come upon the great nature of great all-pervasive openness, which is called meditation free of the intellect and devoid of activity. In such a meditative state, motionlessly rest your body without modifying it like a corpse in a charnel ground. Let your voice rest unmodified, dispensing with all speech and recitations, as if your voice were a lute with its strings cut. Let your mind rest without modification, naturally releasing it in the state of primordial being without altering it in any way. With these three, dispensing with activities of the body, speech, and mind, you settle in meditative equipoise that is devoid of activity. For that reason, this is called meditative equipoise. So that is Dzogchen meditation, but of its course, it's predicated on first having identified Rikpa. And for that to be sustainable, that must be rooted in Vipassana, Otherwise, if you have a glimpse of Rikpa, pristine awareness viewing reality from the perspective of Rikpa, but it's not deeply rooted in the realization of emptiness of all phenomena, then even though you slip into the stream of Rikpa, the old habit of reification will come in and freeze the river, and you'll be knocked out right back into conditioned mind. If you're able to rest in Rikpa, identified Rikpa, identified Rikpa, resting in the flow of Rikpa. But that's not supported with the achievement, the prior achievement of shamatha. You'll rest in Rikpa, and then you'll become distracted. Wandering thoughts will come in, and they'll kidnap you. Or 
the veils of dullness will come in and once again obscure pristine awareness. Because you haven't done your homework. You haven't done the preliminary practices. And hardly anybody does these days. I don't know why. I guess they find them boring. <laughs> and so, if you are there though, you've done all the preliminary practice, including the classic preliminary practices, really understanding the nature of a precious human rebirth with all the leisure and opportunity to achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, rare, more rare than a wish-fulfilling jewel, and the, and the deep saturating of, of your awareness and the reality of subtle and coarse impermanence, of the utter fragility of human life, and the fact that there's no guarantee you'll make it even till tomorrow, but there's an absolute guarantee that this opportunity will pass and you'll no longer be a human being, let alone one with these opportunities. And if you don't take advantage of it, it could be eons before you get this opportunity again, literally eons, because your consciousness never ceases. But this opportunity does. And then to view reality, that seems for many people like a playground, Save up your money, vacation this, new flat screen here, new car, new boyfriend, new girlfriend, new job, good retirement passion. Oh, so many fun things to do. They have a colorful life. And seeing it just saturated by dissatisfaction. With no hope of samsara ever working itself out all by itself. And then with this absolutely daunting, infinitely awesome prospect that consciousness never ceases. Recognizing it's not only it doesn't cease, but with every intentional act of body, speech, and mind, you are sowing the seeds for your own future, for where, where you'll be reborn, the environment you'll be born into, the type of verse you'll take. Every single moment you have an intentional deed, you are creating your own future. And that just suddenly brings an enormous sense of sobriety into every moment. Sobriety as not as in heavy and, oh, I can't handle it. Sobriety as in not drunk but having the sense of just awesome responsibility for your own and everybody's well-being, the sense of ethics being the highest type of intelligence there is. And those are four revolutions. And on the basis of that, that might actually give you the incentive, the drive, the perseverance, and the willingness to make the necessary sacrifices to do whatever it takes to achieve shamatha. Because there's no path, not Mayana path, not Dzogchen path, not Shravak, there's no path at all without shamatha. Realizations, benefits, sure, but path there isn't any. It's not an opinion, that's just the way it is. And why shouldn't it be? With, without shamatha, your mind has all the five obscurations, it's not even functional. So you might actually be inspired to do whatever it takes to achieve shamatha, enjoy it for a day or two, and then lunge ahead into vipassana and identify pristine awareness. And as soon as you three, see those three streams come together into one current, shamatha, vipassana, and identifying pristine awareness, you've now entered the Dzogchen path, and you've reached a point of irreversible transformation. If you bring those three together, you can now say, I'm a Dzogchen practitioner, I've entered the Dzogchen path, and that means I am on my way to perfect enlightenment, and I'll never be off this path again. So what is that worth? What's that worth sacrificing to achieve that? So that's why we want to create an environment where people can do it. It's specifically designed for that. Nothing else, just that. And so, when you have come there, when you have arrived at that point, shamatha vipassana, identifying pristine awareness, that's the point at which you can authentically engage in this practice of in such a meditative state, fused with shamatha, vipassana, and identifying rikpa, that's when you can actually be propelled towards perfect awakening by doing nothing whatsoever motionlessly resting your body like a corpse, your speech silent like a lute on which the strings are cut, and resting your mind without modification, just rele releasing it into space. And that is the most effective, most powerful, and swiftest way to fully realize Dharmakaya. That's the message of Dzogchen, that from that point on, it's effortless. So, that's a brief introduction to the view from the Lake Bourne Vajra. This afternoon then, we'll go further into that, explore more deeply the whole notion of open presence, 
and then really take a close look, very intense look, at nighttime dream yoga in the Dzogchen context. And then we'll get a sneak preview of like a trailer of a movie that's going to come out, come out um, later. And that's it. What's, what's it like on the path of Dzogchen to achieve perfect awakening? We'll, get, we'll see a trailer. Whether you actually get to see the movie or not, <laughs> that depends on what you do between now and later. <laughs> so I was told by the boss that I have to stop talking in about 30 seconds. I'm going to make it really happy. I'm going to stop talking right now. And I'll see you at 2.30 on the button. See you then. <laughs>